money is one of the biggest motivators when it comes to all sorts of crimes, whether it be robberies, selling illegal drugs, or even murder. Everyone could always use a little more money, but most people make do with what they have. Some people are even happy with the life they are lucky enough to live. But some people focus far too much attention on how others see them to the point where they are desperate to appear successful, wealthy, and high status. In today's case, we have someone who genuinely had no reason to do what he did, especially in the manner in which he did it. Some people even question if money was his true motive. So after hearing the details, I want to know why you all think this kind, loving woman was murdered in such a brutal way. But before we get into the case, I want to talk about one way we can all help to keep ourselves safe from scammers, spammers, and data brokers, and anyone else who may want to target and hurt you. Your full name, email, home address, health records, your family members, all that information is out there on the internet for everyone to see. And that is why I started using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura helps keep me and my information safe by showing me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. Cleaning up my information from the web has helped to reduce the spam I get, which honestly was a lot, and helps protect me from hackers who could use this information to access my accounts on social media, my bank accounts, or other sources of sensitive information. When I saw just how much of my personal information was out there for everyone to see, I was shocked. Multiple of my social media accounts actually got hacked last year. It was horrible. I almost completely lost access to a bunch of my accounts if I didn't act fast, and it was really scary. I actually had someone messaging family members, asking them for money, and trying to get people to send Ubers and things like that. It was a complete mess. But I now feel so much more at ease with Aura, knowing that hackers can no longer access my information. Once I set up my account with Aura, they found 16 different sites that were selling my information and started working immediately to protect my privacy. This means removing my phone number and addresses from unwanted sites, leading to reduced spam calls, spam mail, and peace of mind knowing that my data is being protected. But Aura does so much more to protect me from online threats that I can't see. With Aura's, I get other features like antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and much more, all within just one app. Even if you already have one of those tools, like a VPN, not having Aura is like locking your front door, but then keeping your back door wide open. Aura is your one-stop shop for everything you need to protect yourself and your information. Aura is also really easy to set up, it's very user-friendly, and the best part is that you get it all at one affordable price. Aura is always on doing the hard work to keep me safe so I can focus on other tasks, not worrying about my accounts being hacked and losing everything I worked very hard for. To me, that is priceless. I value my privacy and I value yours. To keep yourself and your information safe, head to Aura.com slash Rachel Shannon to start your two-week free trial today. Once again, click the link in the description box below and head to Aura.com slash Rachel Shannon for your two-week free trial today. Thank you again so much to Aura for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into the case. This is the story of Athena Valentini. 64-year-old Athena Valentini lived in Grover Beach, California, where she worked as a nurse at the California Men's Colony State Prison. Those who knew Athena described her as strong, loving, and caring. She lived a simple life, enjoying being outside and walking her dog. She was a ball of light and energy to be around, someone who loved life and made the most of every day. Day. Athena had one son, a then 26-year-old Levente Lazar. According to friends and co-workers of Athena, she and Levente had a great relationship. At the time, Levente was living across the country in Bloomington, Indiana, attending college to earn his master's degree in history. He was living with his girlfriend, doing well in school, and things seemed to be going really well for Levente. Even though her son lived over a thousand miles away, Athena and Levente talked on the phone on almost a daily basis. She wanted to make sure her son knew how much she loved and missed him every single day. While working as a nurse, Athena also owned two condos, one in Grover Beach where she lived and another in Woodland Hills, which provided her additional income from rent payments. But by the morning of October 25th, 2018, Athena was scheduled to work a nursing shift at the prison, but didn't show. Those who worked with Athena knew her as very responsible, a dedicated employee who wouldn't just miss a shift without at least calling. As hours passed with Athena failing to show, 
co-workers called 911 to request a welfare check. By around 11.45 a.m., officers showed up to her home to check on her, and that is when they found Athena Valentini dead inside her home. She was found lying on the floor, surrounded by a pool of blood. She clearly had been brutally attacked, and later autopsy confirmed that her throat had been slashed with an additional 10 stab wounds all over her neck, all of which hit major arteries and veins. The wounds were so severe that she would have died within minutes of the attack. After finding her body and examining the scene, police also realized that Athena's dog was missing. When speaking with neighbors, police discovered that this dog was very well loved and cared for by Athena. He wasn't a dog that would willingly go with a stranger and definitely wouldn't run off if its owner was lying dead in the home. Of course, after finding Athena's body, investigators had to notify her son about his mother's unfortunate death. San Luis Obispo police contacted the Bloomington police in Indiana, who then informed Levente of his mother's tragic murder. This would be difficult news for anyone to receive, let alone a son whose mother had been so violently brutalized. At the start of the investigation into Athena's murder, police started to work under the theory that maybe this had something to do with her job at the prison. It would make sense. She worked with criminals, some of whom may have had it out for her. But after looking further into this theory, they weren't finding anything nothing that could connect any present or past inmates to her death. The next thing that police did was get back into contact with Athena's son, Levente, to see if he had any information that could help out with the investigation. Investigators gave him a call and asked him where he was on the 25th of October, and he said that he was in Bloomington, Indiana, where he lived. So, unfortunately, there wasn't much he could do to help with the investigation. At this point, police still had no idea who could have possibly had a motive to murder this sweet, kind, loving 64-year-old woman. So, police started looking into any and all digital data they could find in the area, starting with some surveillance footage they gathered from Athena's condo complex and in the areas surrounding. On the video, it showed that Athena returned home from work at around 2.39 p.m. on October 24th before leaving the condo again at 3.13 p.m. Video then shows a different car parking in front of her condo before making a U-turn and driving away. By 3.41 p.m., Athena returned home, remaining inside until 6 p.m. when she came back outside to clean her car. By 6.35 p.m., a man is seen walking on 9th Street, heading in the direction of Athena's condominium complex. The person appears to be talking on the phone and is wearing a baseball cap with white shoes. Nothing is seen again until 10.51 p.m. when the same man is seen walking in the direction away from Athena's condo on 9th Street again. This time, Athena's dog is seen walking off-leash following the person down the road. By 10.55 p.m., the same car that was seen earlier is seen once again driving on 9th Street before making a U-turn and leaving the area. This is all very strange all around. Again, this must have been someone known to Athena or at least to her dog because that dog would not have followed just anyone away from its home. The dog was known to be friendly with Athena and people it was familiar with, but when it came to strangers, it was not the nicest dog. The next thing police did was look into Athena's cell phone records to see who she had been talking to in the days and hours leading to her death to see if there was anything unusual about her activity. Her cell phone records showed that on October 25th, the same day that her body was found, there had been a phone number with an Ohio area code that had been contacting her multiple times throughout the day. This wasn't a saved number and wasn't someone who she had been in contact with before then. It was a totally new person she was talking to. Based on that, police decided to look further into the cell phone number to see what carrier they belonged to and found that the Ohio number belonged to someone using a burner phone with Cricut Wireless. Not only that, but they were able to track down where that phone was purchased. Turns out, this prepaid cell phone was purchased from a Best Buy store in Bloomington, Indiana, less than half a mile away from Levente's home. It was purchased under a false name, and then the address given was for a post office in Cincinnati. This was also known to not be the main cell phone Levante was leaving. He also had a Galaxy under a normal number that was saved in his mother's phone, and a phone that he used very frequently. 
So clearly, investigators believe that Levente was the one who purchased the phone and was using it to call his mom over and over and over again on the day of her murder. That would be a hell of a coincidence, and they didn't think it was. After this, police checked the location data on that burner phone, and it showed that starting on October 23rd, the phone pinged on multiple cell towers along the interstate, starting in Indiana before being in Oklahoma, and then eventually, the cell phone pinged all the way in Grover Beach, California. To confirm that it was, in fact, Levente, police then looked into surveillance cameras and license plate readers along the same interstate, and they found that Levente's Jeep had been driving in the same direction that the phone was traveling in at the same time. Then, the car that I told you about earlier making a U-turn in front of Athena's home on the night of her murder, yeah, that also was Levente's car. His phone also pinged in the same area at that same time that she was being murdered. At this point, investigators knew that they needed to bring Levente in and speak with him. They had him go to the Bloomington police station where he gave a voluntary interview. In that interview, he initially denied having gone to California at the time of the murder. He said that the last time he had been to California to see his mother was back in January of 2018, so several months before her death. Since then, he had been in Bloomington, still calling his mom on a regular basis. The last time he actually spoke with her was on October 22nd. When asked if he had multiple cell phones, of course, he said no. He only had that galaxy. Then he got talking about himself and his life. He told officers that he had just completed his master's degree in history and was working in Walt Disney's publishing. He also was into trading in the stock market with more than $100,000 in his brokerage accounts and around $8,000 in his bank account. He also had an annuity that was going to pay out $236,000 when he turned 30, so he only had to wait four years for the full amount, but he was considering selling it sooner than that because he wanted to make a down payment on a home for himself and his girlfriend, so he would have a little bit less than that 236,000, but it would still be a good chunk of change. All of this to say he had plenty going for himself. He had plenty of money, no motive whatsoever for wanting to hurt his mother. However, after giving all of these details and denying traveling to California recently, Investigators confronted him with the evidence that they found up to this point. They told him that they knew his cell phone had traveled along the highway from Indiana to California around the same time of the murder. That was not something he could try to deny. After being backed into the corner, he did admit that he did actually get that second cricket phone and took it with him on his drive to California, but he didn't go there to kill his mother. Instead, he made this drive because he wanted to buy marijuana illegally. He drove all the way to California, stopped in Los Angeles to buy weed, and while there, he did decide to make a surprise visit to his mom. He wanted to stop at the home so he could pick up a ring, a promise ring, that he wanted to give to his girlfriend. But he tried calling his mom and she didn't answer. He figured she must have been at work, so he didn't want to bother her too much, so he decided to just head back to Indiana without seeing her. He said that if he waited for too long for her to be off of work to spend time with her, she would have tried to get him to stay for like a week, and he just didn't have time for all of that. He had other plans he needed to get back to, so he just headed straight back to Indiana. He told investigators that he lied about going to California because he purchased marijuana there and was transporting it across state lines. He believed it was a federal crime and didn't want to get in trouble for it. His lying had nothing to do with his mother's murder. Which, just to note, I do think the story is quite interesting because if you look at where Indiana is compared to California, there are actually plenty of states much closer to Indiana that had legalized recreational weed in 2018. In Michigan, it was legalized in 2018, so he literally could have just driven one state over to get some weed if that's really what he wanted from California. Instead, for whatever reason, he opted to drive over 2,000 miles across the country to get something he could have driven one state over to get. After speaking with Levente about his version of events, they also went and spoke with his girlfriend. His girlfriend confirmed to police that Levente did leave on a road trip, but he told her that he was actually going to Chicago for a stock trading conference with his father. As he was making the long drive, he would call his girlfriend from the burner phone along the way. 
He said that his Galaxy was getting repairs, so that is why he had to call on the burner. As he drove and they spoke, he made up all sorts of stories about places in Illinois he was stopping at. He said that he stopped at the Lego Mega Store. Then he even said that he met Gene Simmons from the band Kiss while they were there. However, what she didn't know was that Leventia's father actually died when Leventia was five years old. So not only did he lie about where he was going, but he also lied about the fact that he had a living father, which is just so bizarre because they had been together for a while. So all this time, he made it seem like he had a father and didn't want to tell her that he had died. It's just such a bizarre thing to lie about. As police were conducting this interview with Levente, they were also able to obtain and execute a search warrant for his apartment. And in that apartment, they found even more incriminating evidence that completely discredited the entire story Levente was trying to tell. One thing they found in that apartment was his iPad, which they sent to the cybercrime lab to examine. On that iPad, they found numerous Google searches in the days before and after Athena's murder. On October 23rd, 2018, Levente made searches on the iPad for things relating to probate, which to put broadly, is a part of the process for administering an estate after someone's passing. He also made searches for whether or not someone can inherit an estate after someone's murder and how it works when the descendant is murdered. He also made searches for directions from Bloomington to Grover Beach. By 11.03 a.m. on October 25th, the location data on the iPad indicated that he was parked at a McDonald's in Winslow, Arizona, where he connected to their Wi-Fi. While there, he made more Google searches for the phrases, Homicide Grover Beach, 9th Street, Levente Lazar, Suspect Grover Beach, Levente Lazar, Murder Grover Beach, and Grover Beach, Murder. As I stated before, Athena's body was not found until around 11.50 that day. So there's no way that Levente should have known about his mother's murder almost an hour before the discovery was made unless he was there for it. That same day, according to cell phone data, the last communication from Levante's Cricket burner phone was made in Oklahoma City before being shut off. By 6.41 p.m. on the 25th, he turned his regular Galaxy cell phone back on in Amarillo, Texas. By noon on October 26th, his phone was back in Bloomington, Indiana. At this point, all signs are pointed directly towards Levente as being responsible for his own mother's murder. His iPad history shows searches for how to inherit an estate after murder, and then he searches for the murder before the body is even discovered. Then, cell phone data shows that he drove from his home in Indiana all the way to Grover Beach on the day of the murder. As if that wasn't enough, the figure seen on surveillance video of the dog following someone walking away from her home on the night of the 25th, that person does match Levente's description. Now, of course, there really isn't any way to confirm for certain that it's him, but they did see his car driving in front of her house that evening. They also confirmed that his burner phone pinged there at the same time that he was seen on surveillance video, so it's pretty confident that this person was him. At this point, we know based on those Google searches that Levente most likely killed his mother for financial reasons. However, what we don't know is why. Why did he apparently need that money? He told officers that he had tons of money saved up in stocks. He said that he finished his degree and was working for Disney Publishing. Things seemed to be going pretty well for him. So, of course, police looked into his financials to see if he was telling the truth about how much money he had, and as you could have expected, what they found was different from what he told them. First, they discovered that Levente never actually finished his master's degree, nor was he employed by Disney. When he submitted his master's thesis, it was actually rejected because it was too long. Then, he did apply for a job with Disney, but he was turned down. They found out that Levente's main source of income was from an annuity he received in a settlement of an estate. This estate was from a boyfriend of Athena's who had previously passed away. He was getting the money from the estate because this man was basically Levante's father figure all throughout his life. Either way, he had received a payment of $97,610 back in 2017. However, since that last payment, his accounts have suffered huge losses. By October of 2018, he had lost $49,000 in the stock market. 
Additionally, he owed about $69,800 in student loans, which he was paying off with monthly payments of about $15. In addition to the student loans, he also owed the IRS $12,226. I'm not exactly sure why he owed that money, but regardless, he owed a lot of money to the government. At the time of the investigation, Levente had about $2,200 in his bank account, along with another $6,000 spread across his three brokerage accounts. Not even close to the $100,000 he told police he had. By the time he was 30, though, he was due for an annuity payment of $236,312, which he was supposed to receive in 2022, Though again, he was considering taking the money out early, paying a penalty of $40,000 if he went through with it. But again, still quite a bit of money. Now, after looking into Athena's financials and other computer records from Levente, they found out that Athena did name her son as the executor of her will. That makes total sense. When you have a kid, that's probably going to be the executor of your will. If you have more than one kid, it's probably going to be split between all of your children. Well, investigators found out that on October 23rd, Levente was emailing with a real estate agent to inquire about the value of Athena's Woodland Hills condo. He realized that it could be sold for a profit of $440,000. He and a real estate agent went back and forth on whether he would need his mother's will or trust paperwork to take control of the condo for him to sell it. At the apartment, investigators did find a paper copy of Athena's will, there was no evidence that it had been mailed to him, so it's thought that when he was at her home in California, he took it with him. So even though Levente seemed to be struggling a little bit financially, it sucks that he lost so much money in the stock market, but overall, he was going to be fine. He was still in a much better position than a lot of 26-year-olds. Unfortunately, though, Levente didn't see it that way. His mother had a net worth of $493,000 and Levente had his eyes on the dollar signs. I also do want to note at this point that we actually do not know what happened to Athena's dog. There have been extensive searches done for the dog according to law enforcement, but to this day, they have not been able to locate it. I don't even want to speculate on what Levente may have done to that poor dog, so I'll just leave it at that. It's never been found, which is very, very unfortunate. So based on all of the information that I've given you up to this point, by November 6, 2018, Levente was formally arrested and charged with the stabbing murder of his mother, 64-year-old Athena. After being arrested in Bloomington, he was extradited back to San Luis Obispo County in California to await his trial, which began about a year after the murder in October of 2019. The prosecution was arguing that Levente murdered his own mother for financial gain. They discussed pretty much everything that I've told you up to this point, how he was in the process of figuring out how to inherit his mother's estate before she died. He was literally making Google searches, asking if he would still inherit her estate if she was murdered. He clearly was not in the financial position he told officers he was in, and he had been suffering from some big losses within the past year. Again, we also have all of that digital forensic data that shows that he drove all the way from Indiana to California. We see his car driving up near her condo and then making a U-turn. Then video showed someone that matches his description walking in front of her house right before the time of the murder. After her murder, her dog is seen following from behind off leash. Again, the dog is only going to follow someone it knows it is not going to just leave with a stranger. After the murder, he goes on his iPad to make a bunch of Google searches for a murder in Grover Beach, even Googling himself to see if he has been named as a suspect. Once again, he made these searches before even investigators knew about her death. So there was only one way he could have known that there was a murder. On the other hand, the defense claimed that Levente is not responsible for the murder. He had no motive, no reason to want his mother dead, and especially not in the way she was found. She was brutally, viciously stabbed to death. Her throat was slit. This is not something Levente would have ever done to his own 
mother. Levente took the stand to testify in his own defense. According to reports, he spoke very confidently when testifying, but became a bit agitated when being questioned about certain parts of his story. Again, he said on the stand that he made this secret trip to California without his mother or girlfriend's knowledge because he wanted to get some weed, but he also wanted to pick up a promise ring for his girlfriend. He didn't want his girlfriend to know about it because it was a surprise. Before leaving for his road trip, he stocked up on essentials like snacks and a bunch of energy drinks. That is also when he got the burner phone. He said that he wanted to use the burner phone because his phone was logged into a video game that would tip off his girlfriend to his location. While in Los Angeles, he stopped and grabbed 15 grams of weed from the dispensary. While there, he did decide to visit his mother last minute, but when he got to her condo, she wasn't there. He decided not to wait for her, instead turning around and going right back home. He never even got out of his car when he went to his mom's condo. When asked about the person in that video that looked just like him at his mom's place, he said that it wasn't him. He said that you can tell it's not him based on how the person walks. When asked about why this person was wearing the same shoes as a pair that he owns, he said that they're Converse shoes, which are very common, and that is true, so it was just a coincidence. He also said that despite what everyone says about Athena's dog, he insisted that the dog was friendly with everyone and likely would have followed a stranger away from the condo while its owner was lying dead in the middle of her home. He testified that the reason he was not truthful when asked about the road trip, again, was because he was afraid of getting in trouble for bringing weed across state lines. When asked about the Google searches, he said that he can't really explain how he knew his mom was dead before officers found her. However, he did say that he just got a gut feeling that something was wrong with her. He added that his mother had an ex-boyfriend that was very abusive towards her. There were also a few neighbors who Athena had filed complaints against in her condo complex. So there were a few people who Levante worried could harm his mother. He was just worried about her, hence the searches. It was just a weird feeling he had, call it a son's intuition. At the trial, he also explained about how he was going to get this big payout from the annuity payment he was expecting, so he wasn't in need of money. Financially, he was doing just fine. He said that it was a mistake to lie to police early in the investigation, that's something he regrets. But his lies do not mean that he committed the murder. The defense also pointed out the lack of physical evidence in this case. Police found no clothes with blood on them. The way she was murdered, there should have been tons of blood all over Levente's backpack and his whole outfit, but they didn't find any bloody clothes. They also never located the murder weapon. They also said that there's no way this surveillance video could possibly be identified as being Levente because of how bad the quality was. The whole case is circumstantial, leaving plenty of room for reasonable doubt. In their closing arguments, the prosecution basically outlined that even though Levente was doing okay financially, he still felt inferior and wanted more. His girlfriend was a third-year medical student who would soon be making a lot more money than him. Meanwhile, his mother, who is originally from Hungary, she is an immigrant success story. She was living the dream and was doing very well for herself financially. Meanwhile, Levente was lying about every aspect of his life to his girlfriend, mother, and everyone around him. He wasn't this savvy stock trader. He didn't even finish his degree. In reality, he was unable to finish his master's. He couldn't get the job he wanted, and he was swimming in debt from his student loans and the money he owed the IRS. The motive couldn't be any clearer. The forensic data points directly at him. He had guilt knowledge from those Google searches. He clearly was in or at least around her condo at the exact time of her murder. He is the only person who could have been responsible. After three weeks of trial, both sides made their closing arguments and the jury went off for deliberations. They deliberated for a few hours before coming back with their verdict. They found that 27-year-old Levente Lazar is in fact guilty of the murder of his own mother, 65-year-old Athena Valentini. For these charges, Levente was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole matter of the people of the state of California versus Levente Laszlo Lazar. Probation is denied. Defendants, the defendant will be sentenced to the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitations as follows. For his conviction on 1021 2019, 
by a jury's verdict of guilty as to count one in violation of Penal Code Section 187, Paragraph A, willful, deliberate, premeditated murder in the first degree of felony. And with the true finding that the murder was carried out for financial gain, the defendant is sentenced to serve life in the state prison without the possibility of parole. For the jury's true finding on October 21st, 2019, to enhancement one, that in the commission of the above offense, the defendant personally used a weapon or a deadly or dangerous weapon within the meaning of Penal Code 12022, parent B, parent one, that that term be stayed. After his sentencing, the assistant DA stated, quote, while no amount of punishment will bring our victim, Athena Valentini, back, a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole is a just outcome for his senseless murder. Mr. Lazar was wrong when he thought he could literally get away with murder by using technology and deception to hide his involvement. We will always use every means at our disposal to find those responsible, even when they attempt to conceal their tracks. Levente did submit an appeal to this decision, but it was ultimately denied. As of right now, Levente remains in prison for the brutal, horrific murder of his own mother. This case was definitely an interesting one to research. I always find it so interesting when investigators are able to use digital forensics to so seamlessly put together an accurate picture of what happened. I do think Levente thought he was being smart by getting a burner phone and then doing the Google searches on his iPad and not connecting anything to his main phone but clearly he didn't realize that burner phones can be traced and so can his iPad. I do agree that this murder was for financial gain, but I cannot fathom why he felt the need to do so when he clearly wasn't in that bad of a financial situation. Again, he wasn't doing much worse than a lot of 26-year-olds, and most 26-year-olds are not expecting annuity payments of over $200,000 when they turn 30. That would be nice. I would like to get $200,000 when I turn 30, but that's not going to happen. So for someone to go out of their way, drive thousands of miles, and then brutally attack their own mother in the way that Athena was murdered, you have to be truly disturbed. I do think there is more to this case than just this financial motive. I think there's a lot more going on with Levente and a lot more going on in his head because you don't just attack someone this viciously, this brutally, just for financial gain. I think there had to be something else. There was some sort of rage, some reason that he was so angry. And honestly, I don't think we will ever know exactly why he did this because I don't think he's ever going to admit that he did this. But that's what I think about all of this. What do you guys think? Do you think that Levente is guilty? Do you think that the prosecution did have enough to convict him or was it too circumstantial? What do you think the true motive was? Do you think it was just financial? Do you think it was financial and, you know, some sort of other reason? Or do you think he was just simply angry at his mother for whatever reason? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell too on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.